welcome to the last day last science talk so before i start i mean i remember that some 15 20 years back probably even now it's true that in high school uh, either students took biology or students took mathematics and some very uh, big hearted and strong people took both maths and biology <laughs> okay so i guess that remains the same okay but over the last 20 years the as also the computational aspects of computer science improved more and more uh, of these things started to come into every aspects of computational aspect started to come in every discipline of science like be it physics be it biology be it genetics be it anything you name it okay and uh, so uh, in our institute uh, we started with physics uh, mathematics and theoretical computer science thinking that they are the mathematical aspects of sciences so we but later we realized the the way mathematics has been you know affecting all other branches of science and with that in mind some 5 6 maybe some 7 8 years back in our institute we started the new branch that was called computational biology okay which in some sense like looks at mathematics as a way to understand biology and things like that and in that sense uh, today our colleague colleague professor arjit samal is from computational biology unit who is trained in biology he is trained in computation he is trained in mathematics and he derives like great what do you call symmetry or non symmetry in nature and things around us using mathematics so today he is going to speak to you about living beings seems to favor odd and simple regulatory logic so with that i invite arjit to come and deliver a talk to you i hope you all will find it enjoyable and interesting thank you thanks saket um first of all this is my first um, talk to such an audience uh, it's really daunting okay when my daughter seven and a half years old asks me question every day at home usually i don't have answers so i'm quite nervous today huh? so <laughs> I counted in my CV that I have given more than 100 talks across uh, academic institutions in my career, but this is the first one and it's very unnerving. So um, what I plan to do is uh, try to give you a feel of a research work which draws from computer science. Um, and there is a sp specific reason why odd and simple have been underlined. Uh, in this title okay it's kind of a simplistic uh, you know sort of an expression of how, what is the take home of a research paper that we have recently published so um, before I go on there are a couple of important acknowledgements the work I'm going to present today is basically led by my PhD student who is in just finished third year Ajay who is actually in the upper floor there if you have any um, you know detailed questions especially regarding the proofs that are in this paper it's Ajay who proved it and in close collaboration with a physicist computer scientist turned biologist like me who happened to be one of my previous mentors Olivier Martin he's in University of Paris at France and I'm trying to simplify a piece of work which is published here okay it's an open access paper which uh, you know you can all access I'll try to simplify some of the take-home messages from this paper for you and it's sort of in the same theme as logic and truths I like to think like that so that's an apt topic to tell you today uh, also you know for children you know who are coming from school uh, it's very important to know that you know I stand here before you because there is uh, taxpayers money which is going to fund me okay and uh, there are you know this is just not an advertisement but I am eternally grateful for the research funding that we have received in the last seven years which allows me to uh, sort of um, you know carry on research without uh, worrying about many things so uh, kindly note that you know without the support 
we won't be able to do much of the research that you're doing and also hold programs like this. So thank you to all the funders out there. Uh, before I go on to the talk, uh, I think there is both a donkey and an elephant in this room. Okay, It could be and or or logic, you can, uh, I'll leave it to you. Okay. Um, so uh, as Saket mentioned, uh, I mean you may get confused that am I a physicist or a biologist or applied mathematician or computer scientist or could be a donkey. Okay, so um, we will try to see that. Huh? Don donkey is called Kalude, right in uh, Tamil, that's what I have heard. Uh, okay, huh? so that's what you like, like it. But um, I don't know what I am and what I want to convince you is that today, particularly in the last 20 years, interdisciplinary research and researchers in particular. So you can do interdisciplinary research, but still not be interdisciplinary researcher because you can bring in your expertise, come in a complementary fashion and do interdisciplinary research. But there are researchers who are interdisciplinary who actually break the barriers as well. They are breaking many such barriers in research. And that's very important for children to know because you may think that you want to be expert in area, which is very good but also you can be at the interface and most importantly I hope to convince you that at least uh, that ideas from quantitative sciences in particular quantitative thinking is actually transforming life science research in the last 20 years and we will see that more and more in the current century okay as you know this is called the century for life science research as you can see from covid now monkeypox right we need life science research for our day-to-day -day survival so here in these areas quantitative thinking and sciences are really transforming research in at the present time okay with that um, what i plan to do is the following um, I don't know if I can cover all the material, but I can convince you one thing, you don't need to write anything because this presentation is a Google slide presentation with an open link. And I am going to share this with the organizers so it can be circulated to all of you, okay? You can have the presentation. So just try to sit back, sit back and grasp whatever you can understand from the presentation. So my idea is to first make a case for computational systems biology that is what can quantitative thinking in a very simple way bring to life science research okay subsequently i'll try to take the problem at hand a particular research problem we have attacked by borrowing concepts from computer science so as you all know i think you're from 9th to 12th so cell is the basic unit of life okay and if you can see the cell, this is actually a eukaryotic cell, not a prokaryotic cell. I don't know if this is taught already, uh, but uh, yeah. So it's a eukaryotic cell. You can see a lot of organelles. Um, so the most important thing you need to remember is that, uh, you know, you have the DNA. The DNA in the eukaryotic cell primarily resides in the nucleus. Let's forget the mitochondria and chloroplast. Uh, there the information is stored the DNA stretches of DNA code for different types of RNA so there is information which is stored in DNA the information is processed into RNA and there are stretches of these RNAs the mRNAs in particular which can get translated into proteins okay there are also non-coding RNAs let's keep it out of the discussion okay so you have the information storage to information processing to the replication stage okay and proteins are the main workers of the cell they carry out many functions but you know, uh, this picture itself, which is the central dogma of biology, immediately leads to networks, that is interactions amongst various components in the cell, okay? Uh, so if you, this is a cartoon representation, this is not exact biology to simplify, you know, the kind of networks that you can at least exist in any cell that you see. So here what I am showing is that there, are, there is a gene A which you can think of as some stretch in the DNA, okay? Another gene B and another gene C, okay? And they code, happen to code for three mRNAs, okay? mRNA A, mRNA B, mRNA C. And they get translated into protein A, protein B, protein C, okay? Simplistically. These proteins, as you know, could, for example, act as enzymes to catalyze various reactions in a metabolic pathway, okay? But these proteins, also 
could interact amongst each other okay and to influence each other's activity for example they could phosphorylate or dephosphorylate one another okay kinases phosphatases furthermore the proteins could also act as regulatory molecules so they could go and bind to the promoter of a gene and influence that's activity so essentially if this gene a codes for protein a it goes and binds and influences the activity of gene b and these two proteins go and bind to the promoter of gene c effectively gene a and gene b are controlling in some way gene c and gene a is controlling gene b so if you look at it there are at least three different types of interactions which are happening between three different types of molecules one which is the protein metabolite interaction the protein protein interaction so red yellow and protein dna interactions okay which is in the blue and if you think hard i mean there are you know slew of molecules in the cell these are not very few molecules so there there are these three different types of interactions which can then lead to three different networks in the cell which are largely studied that is these networks exist in any cell that you take so you have the protein dna interactions leading to the transcriptional regulatory network also popularly known as the gene regulatory network the protein protein interactions lead into protein interaction network and third protein metabolite or the metabolic network okay so uh what i wanted to say is that an important research direction in general in computational systems biology is to borrow tools from quantitative sciences computation physics chemistry to understand both the structure and dynamics of these networks okay you can also take graph theory which is very important in this area okay and you know once you study the structure and dynamics of these networks it is very it's also gives insights on the key functions they carry out in a cell okay so one of the key questions in the area what i work on is to basically understand the structure and dynamics of these networks and furthermore the evolution i don't want to bring in here uh so you may ask why should we study the structure and you know dynamics of these networks what can we learn okay so i want to give this um, you know sort of an analogy to try to motivate why we are interested in understanding biological design in general okay so uh, you know this is a slide which is motivated by what my phd advisor told me when i was starting to do a phd in physics why i should work in this area so for example if you see this picture actually this is taken um, the picture is taken in the factory of boeing okay a uh, jet is being assembled and if you zoom in there are many workers and you know many many components there you know which is going in to create one uh, jet okay one airline airplane so if you see the product of this factory okay which is a billion dollar industry is essentially a airplane but also note that the airplane or the product cannot produce this factory that is you know you need to produce the raw materials you need to provide the workers and they create the plane okay the uh, you know the you know the factory cannot be produced by the airplane okay but for example look at this single cell okay it could be a single eukaryotic cell or a single cellular organism like yeast okay yeast you know is uh, is very key to you know human life for example from bread to beer you have yeast okay uh, bread you most likely eat every day so you know if you take the yeast you know it can largely survive even in a sim in in a simple minimal media and it can grow take nutrients from the environment grow and actually divide into two cells okay and each can further go on survive so you can think of the yeast as also as a factory but the interesting thing about this factory which is a living factory is that the factory is itself the product that is the workers and managers are also produced by the factory so <coughs> sorry what i want to argue is that the design of the two factories one which is the non living and the living must be very different and one of the <coughs> sorry overarching questions which drives computational biologists like me is to decipher these design principles which are particular to biology and towards this goal <coughs> excuse me um 
an important step is to understand the structure and the design principles of the network underlying the cell so i'll just pause here if there are any questions because <coughs> i'm going to under, uh, transform transition to a different topic now from here yeah Huh. No. Yeah, sir. Um, can you go to the previous slide where you showed about the protein A, protein B, those things? Uh, yeah. Right there. You said that uh, protein. Uh, first of all, what is that coding region? In the sense, like there's a region where the computer is coding the gene. Or like, what is that? the coding is basically the sequence so you know uh, the dna is basically a sequence of four letters right atgc so coding region is the part of the letters or the stretch of the letters which actually is coding for the amino acids in the protein not a, a very small region is coding the remaining region is regulatory okay okay and the, you said the, the protein A influences protein B, which further influences protein C, the interaction. Yes. Like, are they useful or like, do they pose a threat? Oh, that's, that's central to biology. Okay. So, so, so that's something I want to take up. So they are going to combinatorially control. So what, you know, uh, you know, from one of the things I want to convey is that, so if you look at it, you know, we all start so let me just, i'll just answer in the next uh, slides okay so it's very important this is just a cartoon but it's not just two genes but maybe five genes or ten genes could control a single gene okay any further question okay good so um so uh two take homes till now uh, you take a cell okay um Inside the cell, you know the central dogma. All of you have learned from DNA to RNA to proteins. Okay, so there are there are these three different types of molecules. They interact amongst each other. These interactions already lead to three different types of networks. They together also form a network of networks. I don't want to get into there. And you know, understanding the structure and dynamics of these networks is very important to you know understand central things in biology. And one of the key questions that we are after in computational systems biology is to understand the design principles of these networks and in particular biological systems. Okay, so let's move on. So I'm going to slowly transition to the topic and get to the point. And this is question which you want to play. So one of the key questions which drive a lot of biological research is the question of development. That is in particular multicellular life like human beings you know you want to understand the developmental program which starts from a fertilized egg and leads to a multicellular organism like me okay so we all start from the fertilized egg and it leads to the complete human being that you see me today but I have very different cell types I have a heart cell I have a liver cell I have a skin cell how do we produce start from this one fertilized egg and produce these different cell types is very important okay and that's key to you know a lot of basic questions but also key to for example diseases like cancer how does certain cell type which is normal suddenly become cancerous okay and all this actually depends on the gene regulation program how the dynamics of the gene regulatory network this both the structure and dynamics is key to understanding these you know transitions which are happening between different cell types so uh, so to give you a simplistic picture this is sort of a simplistic view of it but if you think about it we can start from a single cell like this is a fertilized egg okay and the cell will divide and you can create two identical cells but they can differ in the expression of the genes that is uh, most of you know that we have roughly you know current estimate is about 20,000 to 25,000 genes right in any cell human cell okay but not all 25,000 cells are expressed in any given cell type. That is, if you take the 25,000 genes, they are not ex all expressed in the skin and the heart. 
only a subset of them are expressed in a given cell type okay and what is expressed in a given cell type actually determines the cell type so if you think about it you have started from a single cell and you have created two identical daughter cells but there is a difference in the expression here in the case of a neuron specific gene and here in the case of epithelial specific gene so epithelial is more like you know skin cell okay so that can lead to a neuron and this can lead to epithelial cell so what i wanted to convey is that which genes are on or off in, in a simplistic way that is relating to logic in a given cell type can determine actually its you know destiny good so uh, the actual gene regulatory networks are not that small okay as you can uh, you know all of you know there are 20,000 genes right so it's going to be huge so you need huge compute power actually we don't even know the complete network currently so uh, I mean this is a picture of a transcription regulatory network of E. coli which is already 600 genes that's not complete as well okay <coughs> sorry and this are these are some you know pictures of gene regulatory networks in uh, you know mice for example yeah thank you okay so um, so till now I have convinced you the following three things we need to study these networks okay which are inside any cell and across the cells um, what is active or inactive or what is on or off that is the set of genes will sort of determine which cell type it is right and we need to also understand the design principles so um, so the work that I'm going to present today I mean that's a very small piece of research that we do across many other researches that I go on in my group is basically you know um, the framework and it impinges largely on this foundational figure in I would say complex systems in general who in 1969 that is Stuart Kaufman he's actually a medical doctor turned a systems biologist he thought in 1969 that we could actually use computers to actually model gene regulatory networks in particular he thought that we can use boolean logic and networks okay which is sort of very, very related to the topic of this conference to model these networks and further he already thought at that time and proposed that the different cell types that you see in a multicellular organism because we have the same genome but the skin cell is different from the heart they correspond to different attractors of a gene regulatory network now I have underlined attractors because you may ask what it is and I want to sort of give you a simplistic view of attractors in the next few slides okay good so uh, now I have come to a particular topic that is how we can use boolean logic and networks to model these gene networks okay good so um, just to show you the actual original work these are two papers which came out in 1969 by Stuart Kaufman so this is a paper in journal of theoretical biology and this is a paper in nature where he proposed the use of random boolean networks for modeling gene regulatory networks and you may ask why random boolean networks so imagine this is 1969 okay you really don't have the information on all the genes in the human body you know there is some gene but actually what is the genome we don't know the genome was sequenced only in this century right the human genome so in the absence of real data what Kaufman also took a leap of faith and thought that we, why don't we take random boolean networks and try to understand some general principles about gene regulated dynamics from them and in particular he took random network structure and random choice of boolean function and one of the questions that I am going to address and which is in the paper that we have recently published and I want to tell you about is that are boolean functions or uh, is regulatory logic random in life because Kaufman took it to be random okay and the overwhelming answer I want to give you is that it is not random based on our research and it is a 
particular class of functions which seem to be over represented again and again in real life okay which we have found okay so uh, let me just try to give you a um, sort of a walk you through a toy model to give you a feel of how this boolean network modeling works okay uh, so if you look at boolean so i will take only three genes okay for simplicity so that we can do everything on a single slide okay but actual regulatory network is going to be huge huh 20000 genes huh for your for so that you can understand we'll take three genes okay uh, so a boolean network consists of a set of nodes which take binary values so there are three genes here v1 v2 v3 so their state can be each of them can be in two states huh? on or off okay it's very simplistic like an electric bulb okay on off okay so uh, se second what you need to know in this network is that what influences what that is if you remember that picture protein a protein b were influencing gene c right so here you have the directed edges between the nodes so you see the v2 is influencing v1 so v1 is under the influence of only one of the genes that is v2 but if you look at v2 v2 is under influence of both v2 v1 and v3 while v3 is under the influence of both v1 and v2 is that clear so you also need this directed edges and third you also need the boolean functions or logic update rules one per node so this is the important point i wanted to convey to you that is it is not good enough to know that v1 is under the control of v2 but you have to write the, actually the logical rule based on which the state of v2 would determine the state of v1 and i'll you know sort of expand on this a bit now so similarly v2 is under the control of v1 and v3 so you need a rule based on both v1 and v3 so there are many choices possible but i have chosen a particular choice here so i say that v1 at time t plus 1 so we can you know we can think of how the expression will evolve over time and this is a discrete time system i want to don't want to go into that so i say that time at time t plus 1 v1 will take the same state as v2 at time t okay so this is the logic rule i put for v1 for v2 i write it as you know v2 at time t plus 1 will be what is the state of v1 at time t the logical and and not of v3 okay and similarly for v3 you can put a rule okay so the rule at each node is dependent on the number of the inputs okay i think is that clear or any questions here so essentially this completes the description of the boolean network so essentially if you want to model a gene regulatory network using the boolean framework which is a quite coarse grained simplistic framework but quite powerful in its own right uh, you just need these three features okay you need to have each gene in two states you need to know the directed edges that is the what is controlling the each gene in the network and the boolean function at each node any questions here by any chance no good so uh, you may think why should we believe with this boolean function okay and uh, let me just take a slight discourse to uh, biology okay important event in biology to make a case for boolean logic uh, so um, this is you know a very very important work in event in biology that is work of francois jacob and jack mono who actually deciphered the combinatorial logic of gene regulation okay and they got a, of course a nobel prize in physiology or medicine in 1865 sorry 1965 for their understanding of genetic control of enzyme and viruses virus synthesis in escherichia coli e coli okay so what did uh, jacob and mono do so i want to just simplify this part okay good um, so they looked at the regulation of what is known as a lac operon is that by any chance covered in school yes. oh okay wonderful uh, so i would try to oversimplify and not cover what an operon is okay 
operon is a sort of a modular organization of trans sort of coded genes in a bacterial genome but uh, essentially you know you have a single transcript that is the messenger rna which codes for multiple proteins okay so what is interesting is that and of course to uh, sort of transcribe the gene you need a rna polymerase the machinery there but what is important is the you know what mono and jacob were doing were to develop the tools of genetics to decipher the combinatorial regulation so it is very easy to maybe decipher if a gene is under control of only one other gene but once you are in control of two genes or three genes and actually you see that many genes are in control of hundreds of genes maybe tens and twenties of genes then you have to see how things are in combinatorial control okay and what mono and jacob found at least in this case is that you can at least approximate what i can say the regulation of this lac operon by a simple boolean function okay that's what i want to convey it's a approximation but very nice approximation which can work and that also is a support for doing boolean modeling in gene regulatory networks so if you look at it what you may have learned in your schools is that essentially you know SGDHA coli or E. coli favors glucose okay to grow when glucose is there even if you put lactose it's not going to take up lactose to grow the alternate sugar but when glucose is absent then it would be able to take up lactose so essentially uh, the lac operon is off when both glucose and lactose are present or when glucose is present and lactose is absent and it is off also when both glucose and lactose are absent because if lactose is not present what is the point of having it on okay but it is only on when glucose is absent and lactose is present and how is that managed is the following that when glucose is absent then essentially cap a protein to which actually uh, cmp binds let's forget that can go and bind to the promoter of the operon and when lactose is present then lac repressor would not be bound and so rna polymerase could sit in there so you can actually simplify the logic of lac operon into this truth table where cap is present and lac repressor is absent and then when then is when the operon is present okay so you can write the function the logic of the operon as not lac repressor and cap fine so this is uh, how you know you can codify the regulation at each gene in the genome as a boolean function okay and this is sort of a support for using this coarse grained um, you know modeling framework to study gene regulation in general okay uh, now that i have uh, you know convinced you about uh, you know boolean network modeling let's try to see once you have such a network how would the dynamics progress good so so let's say you know of course you know you are in certain state that would determine the next state okay this is deterministic dynamics so let's say you are in the state 0 1 0 that is v1 is 0 v2 is 1 and v3 is 0 okay and you know in the previous slides i defined the boolean functions or the update rules at each node okay so let's look at it what will be v1 at the next time so this was at time t so we want to see what will be v1 at time t plus 1 okay and that will be given by this rule v1 t plus 1 is equal to v2t since v2 is 1 and v1 is 0 here at the next time what will become v1 one. Oh, excellent good so it will become 1 then what will become v2 i don't remember because i didn't make the slides my student ajay made the slides so you're yeah so it's zero whoever said is right so similarly for v3 you can basically play this rule and you know the answer okay fine so essentially what this says is that if you start from 0 1 0 so i have written them as v1 v2 v3 okay you in the next time step you'll go to 0 1 sorry it should be 1 0 0 okay that's a mistake okay clear um, 
so essentially then uh, if you have three genes each gene can take two states so actually you have eight different states is this clear or not clear excellent so from each state you can figure out what in the next time step you will go to okay which I have written here so if you are in 0 0 0 you can convince yourself that with those rules you will only go to 0 0 0 if you are in 0 0 1 you will go to 0 0 0 okay so these are basically the straight transition graph now this straight transition graph sorry this state these straight transitions can actually be made simpler into a straight transition graph which is shown here so if you are in 1 0 1 you will go to 0 0 1 and then you will flow to 0 0 0 but once you are in 0 0 0 you remain in 0 0 0 is that clear because this is deterministic dynamics and so if you are in 1 1 1 or 0 1 0 you will flow to 1 0 0 which will then take you to 0 1 1 but that will take you back to 1 0 0 which will bring you back in 0 so this is kind of a cycle you will keep you know periodically okay this can be like your circadian clock day and night okay and if you are in 110 you will remain in 110 okay so it's a simple picture simply stick modeling so uh, if you think about it these are like the fixed point attractors i had underlined the word attractors at some point which kaufman had said okay so once you reach this state you are always in that state and these are like cyclic attractors okay you cycle between a few states so um, that's all about the boolean network and its dynamics okay under us deterministic synchronous updates i won't go into asynchronous and other things i'll keep it simple today so what i wanted to convey is that we have assigned a certain boolean function to each node so so this v1 in this toy model that we have taken is dependent on only one other gene v2 and v3 are dependent on two other genes okay so you have a one input boolean function here and two input boolean functions assigned to these two nodes but these are certain particular choices of boolean functions that we have made but there exist many more possibilities okay in particular here so in particular here you have four possibilities of boolean function so how do you compute this four is very simple for a one input boolean function you have only two rows in the truth table okay and each row output can be 1 or 0 2 so you can multiply 2 into 2 so there are four possibilities here you have four possibilities in the truth table four rows and each row can take 0 or 1 so it is 2 into 2 into 2 into 2 okay so 16 so what I wanted to say is that if you think hard about it if you if a gene is controlled by one gene the number of boolean functions possible is 4 but if it's controlled by two genes, it becomes 16. Three genes, 256 possible functions. Four genes, 65,536. Five genes, 4 into 10 to the power 9. So if you look at the human genome, it's very easy to find genes which are controlled by five genes. So if you had to make a Boolean modeling, you have to choose one of these possibilities out of the 10 to the power 9. And if you combine the possibilities across the node, the number of possible Boolean functions is more than the perhaps the galaxies in the universe, okay, for even simple models, okay. So there is a computational challenge here. How do we assign a function? Which functions actually occur in nature? Is there any question here? We had taken a toy model, okay. Since the number of inputs were 1 and 2, the number of possibilities were small. But in reality, the number of possibilities are going to be huge. Clear? Uh, I mean, you can already imagine that at 6, you cannot just enumerate all of them and, you know, start doing, doing exhaustive things are already some challenge. Good. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is the formula. So, the number of truth rows in the truth table for a k input boolean function is 2 to the power k so the number of bfs will be 2 to the power 2 to the power k okay so double exponential so um um praveen how long can i 
continue okay my time is still 2 2 or what 2 okay fine so i have like 25 minutes right okay i'll skip maybe one half of it okay so one half of the result part but let's try to uh, so i want to tell you about a few representations of the boolean function these representations are important because a proof i want to show if i can get there will use some of these representations so uh, so this is a three input boolean function as you can see okay and one property of the boolean function that i will use a particular boolean function is what is known as the bias and bias for me is essentially the number of ones in the output column okay so let me ask a very simple question to all of you so if you have a three input boolean function there are eight rows right in the truth table so what are the possible values of bias that is the number of ones in the output vector huh yeah yeah which are those so what is the minimum value and what is the maximum value zero and eight okay excellent okay so uh, what i will use later on in this talk so uh, so so as i told you there are 256 possible functions right you can convince yourself the following that 128 of them are odd biased and 128 are even biased that is for 128 of the func boolean functions with three inputs the bias would be odd that is the bias would have a odd value and for half of the re remaining half it will be even okay that's a simple you know exercise you all can do i can't prove but i think you are much smarter than me you know you saw the donkey initially right so uh, now the same boolean function can be also written in terms of an expression okay so i i think you know this disjunctive normal normal form and all that let's just forget about it so what is this expression okay so each variable so there are three variables x1 x2 and x3 so this expression essentially captures this boolean function and you are just writing the terms which are one so here it is x1 x2 bar x3 okay that's written here or x1 x2 x3 bar or x1 x2 x3 okay clear and actually this can be further simplified with boolean algebra okay and you can get this form and further factorized like this okay and uh, i think i saw some of the exercises which were given to you so you are familiar with these uh, symbols for and and or operators okay already uh, one other representation of this boolean function would be the hypercube which is important because you know there is a proof i want to show in our work which uses this hypercube representation so uh, so essentially you can if for a k uh, input boolean function you can basically map it to a k cube okay this is a three input boolean function so you have a three cube so three cube will have two to the power three vertices which are eight vertices here okay and essentially the different rows correspond to some of these vertices in this cube okay and so each row of the trot table is the vertex in the hypercube and a vertex a is connected to another vertex b only if by flipping a single bit in a you can get to b so that is if you see 0 0 0 its neighbors on this hypercube are 0 1 0 0 0 1 or 1 0 0 because they differ in only one bit is this part clear good so uh, any vertex in a three cube will have three neighbors any vertex in a k cube will have k neighbors okay in a boolean hypercube now what you can do is that you have these vertices and the output is two values okay zero or one you can use two different colors one for zero one for one okay and that's what i've used blue for zero red for one and the whole you know truth table can be represented by this hypercube is that clear any questions here simple right very simple good so let's just recall because now i'm going to switch to the result part of it uh, so i have taken this toy model 
okay till now to give you a feel of how boolean networking is done with uh, you know gene regulatory networks so here you know you have the nodes the directed edges okay and the functions assigned to each node as we discussed the number of possible functions which can be assigned to each node can be huge depending on the number of inputs right and we chose a particular function in our work okay so I, I want to sort of uh, sort of switch gear and give you a perspective of where we are in biology okay currently uh, I mean if there was a single complaint I have to make about the teaching I received about biology in my school days I was not as smart as you guys uh, was that you know it was not taught in a historical perspective okay and I think it is very important to get a historical perspective of biology to understand where we are today and where the research is going okay it's a very active area of research where developments are happening every other day okay and it's very difficult to keep up with pace of current you know discoveries in biology there's no textbook which covers important developments in the last 10 years usually okay even last year so so if you see i think you have learned a bit about darwin okay 1859 is when darwin gave his theory of evolution um, i should also mention that we are taught only about darwin largely but we should give a lot of credit to alfred wallace I feel bad now that we, I didn't give credit to Wallace. Both Darwin and Wallace should be credited for theory of evolution. So you see work of Mendel, okay? It's published around the same time in 1865. Uh, I hope you all know that Mendel was actually aspiring to become a physicist, okay? He trained under Doppler, okay? The Doppler effect person in Vienna. He had a quantitative bend as well that's why he could actually do such experiments and do quantitative science in his work his work largely went unnoticed and actually were rediscovered only around 1900 okay and you know it was largely thought of work in plant breeding at that time then an important development is by thomas hunt morgan who gave the chromosomal basis of inheritance but all of you read about you know the DNA structure right so see 1953 is when the double helix comes so if you see there is hundred year gap between Darwin and the double helix okay that's a century gap almost but as soon as the double helix came okay there is still about a 15 year time to establish central dogma genetic code and so on and I mentioned the work of G Jacob and Mono, La Coperon, right? Combinatorial regulation, 18, 1965. What is very fascinating is that already Kaufman, without much compute power, in 1969, thinks of using regulatory logic, Boolean logic, sorry, to model gene regulatory networks, okay? So if you see, uh, 1977 is important because you know work of Sanger you know there is sequencing possible now of large stretches of DNA but then after 1990 only around 1997 the first sequences were you know genome sequences became available for uh, you know uh, simpler organisms but the human genome was only published in 2003 and this actually was a data explosion okay we had the components inside the cell okay um, the slew of components and we had huge amount of data and we didn't know how to assimilate it how to compute it how do we comprehend it okay and I would say that subsequently it has been an era of data science and biology okay more and more and now it's really in the full steam in some sense so what I'm going to tell you now is how our work gives a very different picture from the initial picture of Stuart Kaufman because he didn't have the advantage in 1969 he's still alive actually and very active in his uh, late 80s I think or 90s early 90s because he didn't have the data 
he took a leap of faith and modeled it as random boolean networks but what we have now and what we can use this technique for is with data okay data on genes how genes are controlled by other genes that already gives information on actual regulatory control that is actual functions how genes are controlled by other genes okay so um, till now it was really the introduction part and I want to tell you a bit about our research okay in this area uh, so what has happened subsequent to this data explosion and human genome project is that now we actually have not random boolean networks like the toy example I took but real boolean networks for various systems uh, so here are three examples of highly cited boolean models so this is an example of gene regulatory network which controls flower development in Arabidopsis Arabidopsis is actually a model plant okay so if people study plant science in lab most of the tools are available for uh, Arabidopsis like if you are going to study bacteria you're going to take Escherichia coli or Bacillus subtilis okay this is an example of a stem cell differentiation network okay and this is an example of a epithelial cells in response to mechanical cues so so as you can see now these kinds of networks have been constructed of different sizes and each node in this network has its directed edges and also the real boolean function which is capturing the you know biology which is going on at that node how other genes are controlling its scope okay so we no longer need to rely on the random boolean functions okay we can now investigate how in this logic space the real boolean function sits so not just these three networks but uh, my student Ajay when he started doing this work he found that there are at least 88 different networks which have been constructed okay that's a large that's a not a huge num uh, data set in terms of the actual logic space in nature but it's still a very large sample space it's like doing opinion polls right you take 5,000 people and try to predict and it's largely works also in some error bar okay so we have 88 models and these models you know can be partitioned into these various areas like immune response metabolism signaling differentiation and all so these are all real models for real systems and what we did is that we took made a compilation of these models okay and from these models we took the boolean functions which were assigned to each node and we got about 2687 boolean functions which actually capture the real regulation in each at each of these nodes in these models okay and we asked a very simple question and I want to just recall again that's truth table and I think all of you are smarter than me I didn't need that slide you remember that odd bias and even bias if you have odd number of ones in the output value your odd bias function if you have even number of ones your even bias function for a three input case you have 256 total boolean functions 128 are going to be even and 128 are going to be odd so you expect if things were random in the data set that we compiled from real models you would expect half to be even and half to be odd right so what is the answer to it so so this is the analysis which Ajay did and so as you can see it is not just in these models that there are two genes which control or three genes control but you can actually find cases where 14 genes control another gene okay and what you see here in green is the amount the fraction of functions which are odd and in red which are even if you see here overwhelming majority of the functions are all green so which kind of suggests that leaving beings seem to favor this odd biased regulatory logic uh, I am oversimplifying it because we have a very good understanding of why odd leg logic is favored okay uh, because there are certain classes of functions which happen to be odd okay which are overrepresented in this data okay I still have 10 minutes right Praveen okay good huh eight minutes, eight minutes. okay so good so uh, so my first statement is clear 
that living beings favor odd logic i'm not showing you the statistical tests and all uh, you can go and read the paper uh, overwhelmingly uh, whatever you see in real uh, real logic that we have compiled they are odd biased it need not be the case right because it should be half even half odd seems to be most of them are odd okay um, let's attack the other part which is in the title talk title which is simple right so i mean i would try to interpret the word simple as not being complex or even more accurately as minimally complex as possible okay and uh, i don't know how far i can go because i have eight minutes because the second part will require a proof uh, so we actually use two metrics because you know when you talk of complexity even if you talk of complexity of a genome you have to come up with a metric okay is complexity based on the number of genes the genome codes or the number of interactions it codes for okay they can give to give a very different picture if you think about it it's not very different between the number of genes that a yeast cell codes versus a human cell codes okay but the complexity is huge because the number of interactions is what matters okay 6000 and 20000 are not that different but the number of interactions possible is hugely different right so i am going to actually uh, you know sort of uh, use these two measures and what is funny is that this first measure which we borrow was actually used in psychology so it's highly interdisciplinary and we borrow it for a use in a computer science space in biology okay so uh, so what i wanted to say is that you remember we had written an expression for that truth table right and we had factorized the expression and you could get any boolean expression to simplify like this so the definition of boolean complexity for us is the following the number of literals that is the literal is a variable so the literal can be either the zero or the one okay so x or x bar okay the number of literals in the minimal equivalent boolean expression obtained by factorization of the boolean expression okay so if you take this expression for example which is a three input bf okay because there are three variables it can simplify to this and this expression basically has five literals i mean which appear so the boolean complexity is five uh what i can tell you is that you can convince yourself that the minimum boolean complexity where every variable contributes that is the every variable has some effect on the function is equal to k for a k input function so for a three input function it is three and the class of functions which have this minimum boolean complexity property is what are known as read once functions in computer science literature they have had other nomenclature as well but i think the read once functions is essentially the uh, most widely used terminology for these class of functions so if you were to quantify a function in terms of simplicity or in terms of minimum boolean complexity you basically would like read once functions okay but there's very interesting thing about these read once functions i had mentioned that there are at least 65536 four input boolean functions right but if you ask how many of these are read once functions it's only 832 that is only 13% of the logic space at k equal to 4 is read once functions and this actually diminishes to very small values for higher values of k so read once functions actually occupy a very small space within the logic space but they are very simple in terms of this property and there is another class of functions known as nested canalizing functions which are actually a subset of read once functions okay which are of interest to us uh and a second complexity measure which we took is what is known as average sensitivity and the average sensitivity is related to something known as sensitivity okay so the sensitivity of a vertex that is a row in the truth table is 
is the number of neighboring vertices which differ in the output value or color. So if you look at this vertex, there are four neighbors, right? Of which two neighbors here are of different color. So its sensitivity is two. So essentially for each vertex in the hypercube, you can compute the sensitivity. And then across the eight vertices, you can take the average sensitivity, okay? And that's the average sensitivity. And functions with very little average sensitivity are going to be simple. You can take it from me. And so then the question arises, what are the functions which will have the minimum average sensitivity? And, and this problem can be recast as a computer science problem as follows. Actually, you cannot just take K, the number of inputs, but also you have to take the number of ones in the truth table. So I'll call the biases P. So what I wanted to just tell you, I'll leave the slides with you, is that minimizing this uh, sensitivity or average sensitivity or total sensitivity is equivalent for a given value of P and K is equivalent to minimizing the number of edges between the blue and red vertices. So this E01 is basically the number of vertices between the blue and red, okay, in the Boolean hypercube. And I mean, we are not good at proving things, <laughs> okay. So what we were very nicely able to do is find in computer science literature, and this is a, one of the many ways in this problem has been solved, that is how do you choose P vertices on this hypercube such that this E01 is minimized, okay. And this was a problem solved by Sergio Hart, actually Oswell, in the context of game theory. And he has actually found the arrangement, uh, and he has a very simple recipe of how you can choose P vertices on the hypercube such that this E01 is minimized. Uh, I mean, it's very simple. So for example, if you take P equal to 5 and K equal to 4, so you have a Boolean hypercube with 16 vertices, and you have to choose 5 vertices. And uh, 5 is between 2 to the power 2 and 2 to the power 3, so you have to two, take two vertex disjoint Boolean hypercubes, uh, take, you know, four of them in here, and as soon as you're left with one, you can choose here, okay? And this is what is known as a good set. And I won't go into the proof, but what I we were able to show, and this is what's already known in computer science, is that the class of functions which actually maps, that is the Boolean functions which maps to this arrangement, which has minimum average sensitivity, is exactly equal to the nested canalizing functions, okay? Which is a subset of read one's functions. So last, what I wanted to just say, just as a take home, I, I don't have the time. What we have also shown overwhelmingly in this paper is that if you take those two, six, eight, seven functions, which we took from living organisms, the models of living organisms, they happen to be overrepresented in both read ones and NCFs, okay? And actually, most functions that you see in nature, at least in these models, if you believe this coarse grain picture, they happen to be nested canalizing functions, okay? So uh, with that, I will end. I'm sorry I went uh, uh, slightly, maybe uh, more than my time. Maybe, you know, I'm exactly on time. So uh, this kind of suggests that uh, living beings seem to also favor simple or in other words, minimally complex regulatory logic as well, okay? So with that, I'll end and I'm so, I thank you all for your attention and I can take any questions if there is any time left. Thank you very much for your attention.